So we're still talking about diseases that can cause nephrotic syndrome, and the next important one is membranous nephropathy. So this is a glomerular disease that involves immune complex deposition. And so podocytes are particularly affected in this disease, and uh, these immune deposits uh, tend to arise in the subepithelial layer. So under the podocytes is where they deposit. So imagine we did a kidney biopsy on our patient with uh, nephrotic syndrome and membranous nephropathy. This is what you would see. So under uh, PAS stain of the uh, section, you would see prominent and thickened glomerular basement membranes. So compare this image to a normal glomerulus, and you will notice that these membranes are much, much thicker. There's a thick sort of pink uh, layer that you would otherwise not see. And so that tells you that there's something extra there. If you actually want to know what it is, you would do immune fluorescence staining for uh, different materials. And in membranous nephropathy, because it's immune complex deposits, you see this sort of granular staining for IgG. You may see a little bit of C3 staining, but if you were going to stain for IgG, it would look something like this. And this is what we call the granular staining pattern. You can see that it's sort of brighter in some areas and uh, less intense in other areas. It's not a uniform linear staining of all the basement membrane. It's sort of splotchy, and this is how I think of granular staining, and so this is what happens in membranous nephropathy. Likewise, if we looked closer on electron microscopy, we would see foot process effacement. So the podocytes become injured, um, they lose their ultra structure, uh, and slit diaphragms disappear, and thus the patient has proteinuria, nephrotic syndrome, and all the rest of it. Some things that are actually unique for membranous nephropathy are these subepithelial immune deposits. You can see that these are pretty dark, so they're pretty electron dense on EM. Uh, they sort of form these big deposits that are sitting under the podocyte, so under the epithelial cells. So that's why we call it subepithelial deposits. And what's also kind of interesting is that there is a thickened glomerular basement membrane. So in response to the deposits uh, and the injury, Nearby cells actually lay down new layers of basement membrane, and it sort of forms uh, these spikes in between the deposits. So the basement membrane thickens, spikes develop in between the deposits, and then the deposits just sit there. And so this is sort of the characteristic uh, finding on EM for membranous nephropathy. So just like FSGS, just finding the, the histological pattern doesn't mean you're done thinking about the patient and the underlying cause of their disease. So in membranous nephropathy, there are two broad categories. There's a primary membranous and a secondary membranous. And so primary membranous is the name we give to disease that's caused by autoantibody against podocyte antigens. And so right now, about 70% of primary membranous nephropathy is due to this autoantibody against the phospholipase A2 receptor that's found on podocytes. And we actually have a assay to de uh, detect this in the serum of patients. And so, of course, the remaining 30% of patients may have autoantibodies to other podocyte antigens that are yet to be fully discovered and, and uh, figured out. The next class of uh, membranous nephropathy is what we call secondary membranous. And this is in which a patient develops membranous nephropathy due to some other illness or systemic disorder. And so uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, lupus. So patients with lupus nephritis can develop class 5 lupus, which is the membranous form of lupus nephritis. Okay. Medications can do this, like NSAIDs or anti-TNF agents. Some chronic infections, like uh, chronic hepatitis B, uh, rarely chronic hep C can do this, and even syphilis um, have all been uh, reported to cause a membranous nephropathy. Next, one important cause of secondary membranous is a solid organ malignancy. And you can see a list of some of those here, but whenever you find membranous nephropathy in a patient, it's worth considering whether or not they're up to date with their age-appropriate cancer screening, and of course, thinking about your history and physical exam, and whether or not there are any signs or symptoms of an underlying solid malignancy. So this is definitely something to consider um, as you work up your patient with membranous. So another cause of nephrotic syndrome is amyloidosis. And so this is essentially, um, it's a systemic illness, but it can affect the kidney. And so this is essentially accumulation of protein that forms beta pleated sheets. And so when uh, the protein aggregates like this, it's resistant to proteolysis. And so what happens, it just accumulates and accumulates inside of organs. And so what happens in the kidney, it can cause nephrotic syndrome and kidney failure. It can be either accumulation of monoclonal light chains, and we call that AL amyloid, 
or if it's accumulation of serum amyloid A protein, we call that AA amyloid. And so let's pretend like we did a kidney biopsy in a patient with nephrotic syndrome. What would this look like? Well, so on the H and E stain, it would look something like this. Notice the mesangium there. It's expanded. This is sort of the glue that holds the uh, capillaries and tufts together. It's, this is markedly expanded compared to normal. The glomerulus is huge. It's expanded. And it's sort of been replaced by this amorphous, acellular material. And it, you may notice the capillary loops, instead of being nice and open, they're getting compressed. And they're actually um, closing off uh, due to expansion of this mesangial uh, stuff. And so that stuff is the amyloid itself uh, building up inside the kidney. And so remember, you can do other stains, like uh, you can do the Congo red stain to detect amyloid on histology. And also, if you suspect AL amyloid, so monoclonal light chains, you can do immune fluorescence staining for both kappa and lambda light chains uh, to see if those have accumulated inside the glomerulus. And so based on the nature of uh, the different light chains, lambda light chains, when produced in aggregate, tend to accumulate into beta pleated sheets. So uh, the most common type of light chain that causes AL amyloid tends to be the lambda light chain. Next, under electron microscopy, we would see foot process effacement. Remember the podocytes, they're, they're being injured as well. A amyloid will build up within them as well. And if you were to look into a podocyte or a mesangial cell, you will see accumulations of these randomly arranged fibrils. So these are the amyloid fibrils themselves. And if you were able to measure them, they're about 10 nanometers wide. And uh, it's the width that actually helps you determine um, the specificity for the fibril and that helps support that it's amyloid. So this is kind of what amyloid would look like under histology and then electron microscopy. So next I want to talk about another disease that causes nephrotic syndrome and it's uh, sort of related to amyloid in that it's due to deposition of a protein within the kidney and so this is called light chain deposition disease and so this is due to deposition of monoclonal light chains. It's usually due to uh, an underlying plasma cell dyscrasia or multiple myeloma. So there's some abnormal cell population, plasma cell population, that's overproducing light chains. And so when the light chains are out of control, they can uh, accumulate in different parts of the kidney. And so it typically tends to be kappa light chains. So in contrast to amyloid, which typically tends to be lambda light chains, um, when you see light chain deposition disease, typically is kappa light chains that are accumulating and causing the problem. So if we did a kidney biopsy on our patient, if we were looking under um, the microscope at the PAS stain, the glomerulus would look something like this. So the mesangium is expanded. You can see the, the size is increased. It's a large glomerulus. The basement membranes are thickened, and the, there's just excess material here in the mesangium. If you wanted to figure out what that material was, you could stain for um, immune globulins. You could stain for light chains under immune fluorescence. And so uh, let's pretend like uh, this was a, a kappa light chain that was accumulating. It would look something like this under immune fluorescence. It would be bright green both in the mesangium and all along the glomerular basement membranes. So pretty diffuse staining for kappa light chains right here. So next under electron microscopy, the podocytes are effaced. So they're injured and they can't regain their correct structure. And Underneath, you'll see this granular amorphous uh, deposits, and they're in the subendothelial location. So they're um, underneath the basement membrane, right, with the podocytes on top. So this is uh, the deposition of the light chains, and they sort of form this, this sort of granular pepper-like uh, material. If we looked inside mesangium, we would see large aggregates of deposits with this sort of granular amorphous material. And so this is what um, the light chains look like under EM. But uh, remember, we did immune fluorescence to determine exactly what kind of light chain it is. So this is kind of what light chain deposition disease looks like. And, you know, really the difference between, you know, whether a light chain forms an amyloid fibril or whether it forms these big deposits, it just has to do with the, um, the, you know, the chemical nature and structure of each light chain and just how it likes to stick together. That's really what separates the two. But they do produce sort of different patterns on biopsy. Now you may be wondering how would you actually work up a patient who has nephrotic range proteinuria. So let's pretend like uh, we're seeing someone before they had their kidney biopsy. So um, obviously a patient with advanced diabetic nephropathy can lead to nephrotic range proteinuria. So you'd want to make sure you've ruled out diabetes. Okay. 
Also, it's worth checking hepatitis B and hepatitis C serologies. As we've mentioned, chronic hep B or chronic hep C can be associated with uh, membranous and you know some other glomerular diseases. Obviously, test for HIV, as we talked about, um, HIVAN or HIV-associated nephropathy, which is a subtype of FSGS. Also, we've mentioned um, amyloid and um, light chain deposition disease. So serologically, we can check serum-free light chains. And if one of the light chains is present at a very, very high concentration um, in relation to the other, that would be a clue that there's excess light chain being produced, maybe a plasma cell dyscrasia. Alternatively, we could check a serum protein electrophoresis with immune fixation, which would identify any abnormal M proteins or paraproteins. In addition to light chain deposition disease, there's also a, a rare disease called heavy chain deposition disease, where uh, larger immune globulins are sticking together, causing deposits. So the SPEP and immune fixation would catch that as well. Also remember, 70% of primary membranous nephropathy has a pathogenic autoantibody against podocyte antigens. So this antiphospholipase A2 receptor antibody can be detected in, um, in plasma, and so you can send an assay to detect this um, before you do your biopsy. And so if a patient had a very high level of the anti-PLA2R uh, antibody, that would be a great clue that the patient may have primary membranous nephropathy. Okay? However, remember, we can only test for certain diseases um, through uh, serologic testing. And so uh, many diseases, especially like minimal change disease and FSGS, have no serologic uh, markers to date. So kidney biopsy, of course, is the gold standard here, and um, it would pick up uh, diseases that you would miss through serologic testing. So um, these are things you can sort of order during your workup as you're thinking about doing your biopsy.